The recording has begun. All right, welcome everyone to our study of Romans chapter three. Uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word, uh, the gift of your word made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ and, and the work of your Holy Spirit in us to, uh, to hear these words, to help us understand and believe and apply them and to carry them forward in the, into the world. Uh, we ask that this time would be um, honoring to you and, and a blessing to us as we receive the gifts that you have to give us uh, through this, this passage. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, so Romans 3. Um, let's dive in. Uh, before we get to the, the handout that I sent around, which I will share and, and kind of walk through, just a couple words of, of introduction. Um, in the first couple chapters of Romans, we've essentially been dealing with um, the, the problem of sin and, and what sin does to our relationship with God. And so in chapter one, we get verses like uh, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed against uh, from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness. We get verse 32, um, those who practice such things deserve to die. Uh, in chapter two, uh, therefore you have no excuse when you judge for you yourself do the same things. And in verse six, he will repay according to each one's deeds. Uh, to those who patiently do good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Well, for those who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth but wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. And, and so we get this really gloomy picture of, of humanity and what it does to our relationship with God. Um, and it sounds very much like if, <laughs> if we are all uh, sinful and God repays each of us according to our deeds, we're all in that latter category. Uh, which, which is not a good, good place to be. Um, then we get to Romans chapter 8, <laughs> verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And in verse um, uh, 31, if God is for us, who is against us? Um, 37, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for nothing can separate us from the love of God. Um, how do we get from point A to point B? How do we get from essentially what sounds like universal condemnation to uh, eternal, uh, 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 the word I'm thinking of is sonship, but whatever the gender neutral form of sonship is, childship just doesn't work, uh, you know, in eternity as heirs of God in Christ, of all good things who are united to God, um, for eternity in a way that nothing can separate. How do we get there? Um, well, Romans chapters three through eight essentially are the, the theological grounding of how that happens. How does God get us from this hopeless state to this state of perfect bliss and hopefulness and glory? Um, and a large part of that is, is explained by Paul in chapters three through five is, is what we've come to understand as the doctrine of justification. And so over these next three weeks, we're going to be digging into that. So what I'm presenting today will include some intro for chapter three, but also some intro for chapters three through five, which cover the issue, and, and also somewhat of an intro to chapters three through eight <laughs> to carry us all the way there to kind of get, get some categories to fit things into. Um, as, as I mentioned um, at the end of last week's meeting, uh, it, it can be really easy to to slip between categories here and, and confuse some things in ways that, that um, you know, are not just, oh, we got the theology a little bit wrong, which, which ultimately isn't a, a big deal, um, uh, but uh, it, it can lead to some, some practice and some fundamental understandings that uh, can get us into some hot water, or at the very least into some conflict with other believers who think about things differently. And a lot of that comes from viewing uh, the importance of justification and then either dismissing other things that are actually also really important or trying to pile extra things into that category so they all can share that importance. And those, those are two traps that, that I've fallen into at various points that I've seen a lot of Christians, even whole denominations fall into wars fought over in the history of, of the church. And so I'm, I'm hoping today we can kind of lay this out in a way that, that allows us an easier route into, into slotting these things and, and giving them 
all their their due uh, scripturally and, and uh, spiritually speaking. So to do that, um, we're going to walk through um, what some have called the plan of salvation um, or the order of salvation in Latin, the ordo salutis. Um, if if you uh, are, are a, a fan of using those those kinds of terms, um, or the the doctrine or doctrines of salvation, the the fancy seminary word for that is soteriology, the study of salvation. Um, but really, it's just a, a walk through of what the Bible teaches us about these various things that relate to how we get from point A to point B, how we get from our our state as humans apart from Christ to the glory that awaits those who are united in Christ Jesus. Um, if you've got your Bibles open to Romans 3, um, just flip over a couple pages to Romans 8, the very end, um, verses 29 and 30. This, this is going to be, if, if anything, the kind of key to, to <laughs> unlocking these, these chapters here. Verse 29, Paul writes, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family, or the firstborn of, of many siblings. Um, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There's a couple important things here. One is, is we see that our salvation is from God from beginning to end. We see that it's in past tense. It's been accomplished. Even the things that haven't yet taken place, Paul writes in the past tense, um, you're keeping score at home. Technically, the aorist tense, I don't know a whole lot about that, except the theologians who point that out say that means it's done. It's as good as done. God has said it. It's done. Uh, we can bank on it, um, right? And, and so all of these things have already been accomplished on our behalf. Um, another important thing to see is that um, the groups of people in each of these categories are, are the same people, right? So it's not that, um, well, many were called and then a lesser amount were justified, and then only some of them were glorified in the end, that it gets smaller and smaller as we go. But but no, all who are called are justified and are glorified. I should point out, of course, that Jesus himself said many are called, but few are chosen. Um, James said we're justified not by faith alone. In both cases, if we, we can dig into this in discussion, but in both cases, um, I believe very strongly that they're teaching the same things using slightly different vocabulary. And that's another way we get tripped up here. So I'll, as we go through the categories, I'll kind of point out where those other things fit. Um, so you're not right from the start saying, hold on a second, Jesus said many are called, but few are chosen. Um, I think when Jesus is chosen there, that's what Paul means by called here. But we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but it's very important to see that this is all coming from God and that all of these things happen in the life of, of one who is in Christ and that they happen in a particular order. Now, this is not every event. Um, Paul's giving a summary here. He gives a similar statement in, I think it's 1 Corinthians that have a couple different terms in there. Um, and of course we see things from Jesus and James and the author of Hebrews that we also might fit into here as well. Um, but ultimately this is, this is the, the kind of, the very high level plan we have predestination, calling, justification, glorification, and, and some other things in between. And that that plan is, is the plan we're going to walk through. Um, and that can help us a lot as we unlock the things in Romans 3. So let me pull up this handout that I sent around. I, I say handout, even it, it's an email out. Um, and uh, we'll walk through this. As I said in the email, there's a lot of information here. And we're we're not all gonna come away today uh, having a perfect and complete understanding of everything. It's it's more, it's the map. We lay out the map. We haven't been to every city on the map, but by seeing it all laid out, we can find our route through it as we go. And then we explore those places and learn more about them as we visit the places along our route. That's what we're going through here. Um, and again, I, I'm drawing on a long history of people laying these out before. Um, I didn't put all their names there, but there's a link to several of them in, in the email. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. I always end up quoting um, Julie Andrews there, sorry. <laughs> um, Rodgers and Hammerstein, whichever. Um, so in eternity past, we talked about this in our discussion of Romans 9, so we don't need to talk about it in detail, but our salvation doesn't begin with our conversion. It doesn't begin with our hearing of the gospel. It doesn't even begin 
at our birth. It begins, as Paul says, before the foundations of the world in which God decreed um, a plan of salvation. And uh, I would argue, and I think Paul argues, um, a, a particular people um, that, that God has, has set his sights on um, and has sent his, his son and his spirit to work salvation in. Um, that's where it starts. And in some ways, once that decree is made, it's done. Of course, nothing has taken place yet. Um, but even at that point in eternity past, we can see a security in our standing before God. That's all I'll say about that one because we unpack that a lot in Romans 9. Um, now we get into what I'm calling the historical past. So these are the things that have happened, you know, post-creation, but before our, uh, our lives. Um, so we have original sin and we have the promises of God. Now, the difference between original sin and actual sin, we will deal with in chapter five. So I don't want to go too far into that today either. I just want to lay these, these concepts out as, as things that we'll slide into. And we can refer back to this in a couple of weeks when we walk through chapter five. But essentially, original sin, sometimes also called the covenant of works or the Adamic covenant, the covenant between God and Adam, um, it teaches that because Adam broke his covenant with God, um, all humanity shares a fallen sinful nature. And we've got some quotes here from Romans 5 and, and elsewhere, uh, sorry, these pictures are in the way, Ephesians 2, um, that talk about our, our natural state um, being one of uh, opposition to God, being one of separation from God. And, and Paul's been unpacking that in the first couple chapters of Romans, what that means um, for us. Uh, but of course, immediately after the fall, immediately after the sin of Adam and Eve, um, God makes his first promise of a savior to come. Um, and that promise, uh, often called the covenant of grace or the Abrahamic covenant, where it's really laid out in detail with Abraham, is the promise of Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. And it's not just a name for Jesus that we remember and sing about at Christmas and, and Advent. Um, it is the fundamental promise of God in salvation. Uh, he says in Leviticus 26, I will make my dwelling in your midst. I shall not abhor you and I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. Um, there's, there's some details from Genesis and Jeremiah about all the, the, the covenantal stipulations and, and what all that means. Um, but fundamentally, um, God's promise is to be with us. And, and that's the goal. Um, even salvation from our sins isn't the goal. It's a precondition for us having that fellowship with God. And I should point out, this isn't just a restoration of what Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden with God. This is better. Uh, even then, there was, there was the specter of the possibility of the fall, and then, and then that happens. Um, but this is uh, a, a point at which there is no more sin. There is no more death. There is no more pain. There is, there is nothing but um, union with God and all the good things, uh, unrestricted uh, gifts of God to us um, in, in a perfect communion with him. Um, that is the goal of all of these things. And so those promises come right with the, the, first, the first sign of anything going wrong. God makes that promise and unfolds that throughout scripture. And that promise is the same before Christ and after Christ, Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, old, young, at, there, there is no distinction, as we'll see in this chapter. Those promises are the same um, for all of God's people. Um, all of that happens before any of us are born. And in fact, even before Christ is born on, on the earth. Um, and so let's, let's fast forward now to our lifetime. So our life before conversion, what happens? Well, we actually sin. So this is different than original sin, and we'll unpack the difference in a couple weeks, but we break the law of God. And as we saw in Romans 1 and 2, that law could be the Torah given at Mount Sinai, essentially the Ten Commandments. Um, or it could be the law that's written on our hearts, um, our, our conscience, or our deep down knowing what's right and wrong. And we see in the writings of Paul and James and others um, that uh, there is none who can actually keep this law apart from Christ. And, and so we are all in a state of having sinned against God's law. Um, okay, but then God issues a call. Now, this is uh, what some call the outward call. So this is not the call of Romans 8. This is the call of when Jesus says, many are called, but few are chosen. This is the outward call of the gospel, 
This is what um, some Reformed theologians have said, we should preach promiscuously. We should spread as far and wide in the world as we can. Um, God is calling us to himself primarily, ordinarily, though not exclusively, um, through the hearing of his word, particularly the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see that in Romans 10, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Um, and we see commands like the Great Commission as Jesus is leaving the earth uh, to go and spread this message throughout the entire world so that we can make disciples and, and participate in, in the, the expansion and the reign of God's kingdom. Now, just because we have heard the gospel does not mean that it has taken root in our lives. As Jesus tells the parable of, of the sower, you know, seeds are going all over the place. Some are landing on the road, some are going into rocky soil, thorny soil, fertile soil, and, and they all have various aspects of growth or, or non-growth. Um, this call is the spreading of that seed as far and wide as we can. Um, but it is not our, our conversion. Now, what happens uh, when we get to conversion is a whole bunch of things. Now, I've listed them in an order here, and the ordo salutis puts them in an order. Um, that order is largely a logical one deduced from scripture. Um, in reality, these things, regeneration, faith, repentance, justification, and adoption, all happen pretty much simultaneously. So one may cause the other, um, even if they don't happen, uh, you know, one and then the other. For example, um, I, I thought of you know, a couple examples. If, if a, a ball hits the window, the, the window breaks simultaneously with the ball hitting it, but no one would ever argue that the window breaking caused the ball to hit it. The ball hitting the window is what caused it to break, right? Or if, uh, if someone, I don't know, let's just say Father Ted is an example because he would never do this, punches me in the face. I will feel that pain right when the fist hits my face, but that pain is not causing his fist to do anything. <laughs> They're happening simultaneously, yet one is causal, um, right? Sorry, a little tongue-in-cheek example there, but uh, 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 no, <laughs> fist-in-cheek example. Um, but these things tend to happen uh, simultaneously and, and in some cases instantaneously, um, but uh, there is a causal relationship. It's also worth pointing out that some of us know when this happened in our lives. And some of us don't because we've been discipled gradually through our up upbringing in, in the church and in the faith. Both are totally normal and both are, are biblical, um, but that doesn't take away from the very particularity about what we're talking about here. Okay, so in our conversion, um, that begins logically with regeneration. And this is uh, some, sometimes called inward calling or effectual calling. Um, this is the calling Paul's talking about in Romans 8, the calling that applies to all who are justified. This is the spirit waking us up from that spiritual death. We were dead to sin. We're, we're now being made alive in Christ. And it's the spirit who works that resurrection in us, just as Romans 1 says, the spirit raised Christ from the dead um, bodily. He's raising us from the dead spiritually. Um, so we've got quotes from Ephesians and John here um, about both the need to be born again of the spirit to be brought back to life, um, and that it is something that God does to us when we were dead in our sins. Um, that regeneration, or that being born again, that effectual calling, um, leads us to faith, right? And in faith, faith is not something we try really hard to believe, right? Faith, biblically, is, is a trust or even a resting wholly in the work of Jesus Christ to save us from our sin and restore our relationship with God. Right, so Paul says in Romans 4, to the one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. Um, that we're justified by faith apart from works of the law. And it's, it's that faith, that trust in Jesus's work um, that uh, brings Christ's righteousness to us, not our working to muster up enough belief to, to make it across the, uh, across the line. That faith uh, leads to repentance. We turn from our sins and follow God. And again, these things happen or should happen uh, simultaneously. And all these things grow throughout our Christian life. Let's, let's be clear about that as well. Um, but there's a key moment, right, when, when God gifts these things to us. Um, in repentance, we turn from our sins and follow after God. Um, and so th this is an important point. Faith without works, faith that leaves us in our sin is, is not faith in the work of Christ. It is not a response to God's gift 
of righteousness. Um, and, and it is not a, a sign of having been awakened by the Spirit to new life in Christ. Faith and repentance absolutely go together. Um, and now there's justification, uh, which is the key thing we're unpacking here in Romans 3. And justification, simple definition, is our being counted righteous before God. Now, the Bible uses both forensic and transactional uh, language around this, and, and we often want to kind of shy away from that. It's, it's too late capitalist, it's too Western and individualist, and, and so on. But the Bible does use um, you know, financial language, that, that God's righteousness is credited to our account, that the Holy Spirit is a deposit on our inheritance. You can see in the inheritance context or, or the idea of a ransom that we get in the Bible, it's, it's an older form of, of financial uh, metaphor here, but it is a metaphor used repeatedly in the Bible, as well as a forensic declaration, like standing in court and not only being declared not guilty or even innocent, but something we don't have in the American court system, being declared righteous, like having good, good works to spare, having righteousness to spare, right? And this righteousness, as we talked about a bit in the past in our study of Romans here, is, is a righteousness that comes from God as a gift. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 is a great illustration of, of how this happens. Um, Paul writes, for our sake, God made him uh, to be sin who knew no sin. So that's Jesus. Um, so that in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. And so the idea here is Christ, he did two things for us when he was on the earth. He lived a perfectly righteous life fulfilling the law. And then he died a death on the cross, uh, paying the penalty for our sins. He on the cross took our sin on him. In fact, Paul says he became sin for us and then gave us his righteousness, right? He, he died the death that we deserve so that we could have the righteousness and the life that he deserved. That great exchange is essentially what justification is here. Um, and so it is a gift from God. If it, if it were something that we could work towards, then it would not be Christ's righteousness that's saving us. It would not be a gift. It would be our own righteousness. And, and then therefore we would not need the cross. And, and that, is, that is a very important thing to keep in mind here in, in terms of Paul's explanation of justification. So in justification, we are counted righteous before God. That righteousness is an alien righteousness given to us by Jesus um, and is only made possible because he fulfilled the law completely in his earthly life and then paid the penalty for our sin. Uh, the same way that we see in the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, the sin being transferred onto the scapegoat. Jesus is our scapegoat. He is our Passover lamb. All of this language from the Old Testament we see in our Eucharistic liturgy is expressing the same truth. Jesus is taking our sin so that we can not only be now without sin, but that we can be righteous and have Jesus's righteousness. Um, with this, we are also declared to be children of God and co-heirs with Christ. And so Paul uses the language of adoption there. Um, and, and as uh, do other authors in scripture, um, John 1, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. Um, and he destined us for adoption as his children through Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul gives us in Ephesians. Okay, so that's, that's conversion, right? Now, that's not all of the salvation story, it, and that's the problem. If we focus on that, you have to pray a prayer, express that faith, repent from your sins in five minutes, and then it's done right? And then, then it's just a matter of whether or not you were a good Christian and got rewards. No, that's not the end of the story. That is the end of, of what gets us to the point of being counted righteous in Christ. But unless we instantly die at that moment, there is much more to come. Um, the, the seeds have been planted and God has promised it will grow and bear fruit. But for the rest of our lives, we are cultivating that plant and seeing it grow and seeing it bear fruit. And ultimately, that is what um, is the goal here. Um, that predestination in Romans 8 is to be conformed to the image of Christ. The, the working of God's grace in Ephesians 2 is that we might um, uh, live a life of good works that God has prepared for us to walk in. So that is the goal here. We might love God and neighbor freely. Um, and so that's what happens in life after conversion. This is really the focus of chapter six and seven in Romans. Um, 
the doctrine of sanctification, by which God makes us progressively more holy and empowers us to do good works that please him and serve others. Um, in Philippians, Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That sounds kind of scary. Sounds like it's up to me. Sounds like I could really drop the ball here, and I probably will. And then continues, for it is God who has worked within you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so it's still, even our sanctification is a work of God in us. Um, in all of these things, we play a part, of course, and we have a response that God commands us to take, but it is God who is doing the work. Um, and we've talked already about Romans 12 and the following passages about how, how we are to live that life out. And so we'll, we'll come back to the doctrine more in a couple of weeks. And we've dealt with a lot of the practical elements there. Um, of course, there is then the, the, final, the final point here of our life after conversion, and that is perseverance, um, also called assurance of salvation. Um, and this doctrine, uh, the Bible teaches us that we can be assured by God's work and promises that we will persevere to the end, overcoming sin and death. Paul writes in Philippians, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will uh, be able to be faithful to complete it. Sorry, I'm mixing up what's written here with the King James I memorized as a kid. Uh, <laughs> but God began the work. He will complete the work um, in the end. Um, uh, in Ephesians, he writes that the Holy Spirit is the pledge or the deposit of our inheritance. It's the guarantee, the financial guarantee of what's to come. Um, to the praise of God's glory. And in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Um, and uh, of course, it's, it's seeing both the promises of God and God's working faith and repentance and sanctification in us that, that gives us that assurance of salvation. It is the sign and seal of the sacraments that he's given us that point us to God's work among us. Um, God has given us many signposts pointing to this assurance, and, and as much as we might want to emphasize the work we need to do, and we do have work to do, uh, we, we never want that to take away from the assurance that comes from looking at the work of God and resting in his promises. Um, and of course, it's important to keep in mind um, when Paul writes in Galatians, we don't want to submit again to a law, to a yoke of slavery, he calls us, because we are to use our freedom to love others. It is our freedom from condemnation. It is our, is our assurance of being righteous before God that allows us to freely love God and others without worrying about our own standing. Um, if I'm worried about, did I do enough? Um, I will be working for my, my own gain. If I can rest in God's promises and, and relax that focus on, did I do enough to get in? I can focus on what it means to love others wholly. Um, and that's, that's really uh, the goal here in, in much of what Paul explains. And then lastly, our salvation still isn't done yet because we're still in these mortal bodies. We're still uh, following our sin nature from time to time. We're still in conflict with God and, and our fellow humans and, and his creation. Um, but in eternity future, we start in eternity past, we go to eternity future, we have what Paul calls glorification um, or what else where we see as resurrection to life heaven, the new heavens, the new earth. Um, and this is the promise that we will be raised body and soul to new and unending life and unity with Christ. Um, and so the goal is not just heaven on earth um, now, though that is certainly the work that we should be doing, but the ultimate goal and the ultimate promise is that all things are being made new and one day we will be without sin, without death, without suffering because of the work that Christ has done um, in us <clears throat> and for us. Okay, so that's that's the whole kind of intro to these things. Um, I have a couple small things. I, I know that took a while, but it it's it's kind of intro for a few chapters here. So I hope that's okay with you all. I have a couple um, other things from Romans three. I want to just kind of put out so we can uh, have as seeds for discussion. Um, first thing is that like the sin issue that that is dealt with early on in the chap chapter. Um, we've talked a lot about in chapters, actually I'll stop sharing here. Uh, we've talked a lot about that issue in chapters uh, one and two, so I don't want to rehash that. Uh, we've got new things to discuss, but it is there and, and worth digging into. And if people have questions, we can absolutely talk about them. Um, there's also the Jew-Gentile issue. Paul says here there's no distinction. We are all sinful in the same way. We are all justified in the same way. We are one in Christ. Um, 
regardless of our, our background there. Um, that's another issue we've addressed a lot in our study of Romans and before that study of Acts. I don't want to dive in too deeply to that today other than to note that it's there and the discussions we've had give the context for why that's there. Um, what I do want to raise though, and, um, and mostly for the, the point of discussion, is the idea here that in the first century, the advantages that a Jewish believer would have, or that Paul would see a Jewish believer have having here, um, maybe or maybe not would apply today to a Jewish follower of Christ. I, I want to put forward that there's another group of Christians that have many of these same advantages, and, and that's what I want to kind of unpack in our discussion. Um, people who grew up in the church are, I think, the 21st century version um, uh, most of the time of, of what he's talking about here. They're the ones who have the advantages described here and in chapter nine. Um, we, we grew up hearing the word, we grew up seeing the sacraments, we grew up in a worshiping community, we had a family discipling us in the faith. Um, these, these entrustments of the oracles of God, <laughs> the sacraments, um, are, are things that are of great advantages uh, growing up. Um, and yet also, note in Romans later, it's, it's these, uh, these people who have these advantages that are often sometimes described by Paul as, as the weaker sibling because they want to rely on those traditions um, as opposed to you know, constantly viewing the gospel with fresh eyes and seeing what Christ is doing that they weren't previously aware of. Um, and so th this is kind of opening for discussion in, in what ways do those of us who grew up in the church have these advantages um, and, and in, in what ways are there disadvantages that come with that? And then we can flip that for those who, who came to Christ later in life. What are the disadvantages and advantages of, um, of seeing the gospel with fresh eyes after having lived a life outside of the worshiping community? Um, and what implications does that have for how we live together and treat each other in this community? Um, how do we serve each other mutually from those positions of advantage and disadvantage? So some things to discuss there. Um, Lastly, just like in Romans 9, uh, we got a, a big theological treatise about a doctrine couched in uh, or with this underlying question of like, but can we trust God? Can we trust his promises? We have a little bit of that here. Can we trust him? In the end of Romans 3, um, verse 25 and 26, after Paul says, this is how justification happens. He says, God did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. And it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Um, other, other translations say to show that he is just and the justifier. Um, and and it's, it's easy for us to think about God as a loving and forgiving God. And therefore, um, uh, of course, it is right for him to, to be loving and to, to give the gift of righteousness to sinners because it's an outflowing of his love. But if you were um, a family member of Uriah or Bathsheba in the Old Testament, think back to that story. David sees Bathsheba, desires her to be his, his spouse, effectively arranges for her husband to be killed in battle so that he can take her in and, and become an additional wife within his family. Um, and, uh, you know, he prays God against you and you alone have I sinned, uh, which always, <laughs> always jumps out to me like, you know, no, <laughs> not quite. Um, and, and thinking about like, okay, there were consequences to his sin, but there was also forgiveness and there was restoration relationship. And isn't that nice? We can be like David, even if we sin really badly, God has uh, good things in store for us. Same for Paul, the chief of sinners, the persecutor of the church, the murderer of Christ's followers can be made into an apostle. Isn't that a wonderful story? But what if you're the family member of the person that died um, or, or was essentially taken, kidnapped into the king's harem, um, right? Like, if you are that person, what does it mean for God to love you? Is God just to forgive, to pass over that sin? Um, and that's really what Paul is unfolding here. And the only way that can happen is, is not if just a gift of righteousness is given. That can show God's love and it can show his mercy. But to show his justice at the same time, to show that that righteousness even has a value, um, there has to be a, a cost to it. And so that's where um, the great exchange, Christ taking on our sin at the cross and giving his righteousness is, is important. Um, and therefore, we can rely on the fact that God is 
not only merciful and loving towards us, but he, he is not sacrificing any ounce of his justice to do that. That the righteousness that he gives us as a gift is the righteousness that is perfect and holy and stands for what is right in every situation. Um, it's not a righteousness, what, what Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace as opposed to free grace, cheap grace being in and whatever. Just, just take some, right? It's, I, I print the money, have as much as you want, that deflates the currency, right? But by God in his freedom, giving us something very costly of himself to us, he can prove without sacrificing any of his justice or righteousness, um, his, his love towards us. Um, so those verses, they're, they're kind of difficult, and, and so I want to leave some time to talk about them if, if they're difficult for you as well. But the discussion questions that come from those would be, what do these verses tell us about God's justice? What do they tell us about our sin? What, is they, what do they tell us about the significance of Christ's work on the cross? Um, okay, so with those questions, the, um, the, 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 uh, the kind of the adult convert versus the cradle Christian discussion, um, and anything else that, that came up um, for you all as, as I was walking through this or, or from the handout that I sent around, those are, uh, you know, my... <laughs> my discussion questions for us, but of course, as always, any, any insights or questions you all have, we're, we're open to. So why don't we go ahead and, and stop the recording and we can dive into discussion.